Hello and welcome. Uh, welcome to the Future of Dinghy Sailing webinar. Uh, my name is Alistair Dixon. I'm the Director of Sport Development here at the RWA. Um, and just before we proceed any further, I just wanted to check that you can all hear us. Um, we've also got a large number of people all logged on, but if somebody could see the questions, just the right hand side, and just by entering a question, just let us know that you can hear us. Anybody, anybody answer a question? Just say yes, we can hear you. Uh, sorry, we're a bunch of amateurs here. Yes, yeah, right, we can now hear the questions. We're gonna have plenty of fumbles as we as we go through this. This is very much our, our first webinar. Um so just to give a bit of an overview, I'm, I'm sure you've read the, the, the brief. Effectively, um, these are two reruns of two talks um, that were given at this year's Dinghy Show. The reason that we're rerunning them is we had so much interest um, from the talks. They were really, really impactful. And we thought, actually, you know, we're talking about technology within these talks. Why don't we use technology and get this message or these messages out to as many people as possible? So we've put together this webinar um, and it's myself as the sort of MC and overview. Uh, and then we also have Liz Rushell, who's giving an overview um, of the work that she's been doing for British Marine with the Futures Project. And also Mark Jardine, who's giving a quick overview of the talk that he did at, at the main stage at the Dinghy Show this year. So I'm just going to hand over to Liz and Mark, who are just going to do a quick two minute introduction to them and some of the stuff that they're going to run through. Good evening, everybody. It's Liz Russell here. Um, yeah, just very quick background. I'm a, a dinghy sailor, grew up sailing, messing around in Chichester Harbour, sort of fell into dinghy racing, um, went on and did numerous different things and, and now mess around in my classic boat and sometimes race that too. Um, in, my, in my real life, I'm a marketing consultant. I spend quite a lot of time in the marine industry. I'm very passionate about the sport and seeing the growth of the sport and growing participation. So in my spare time, I sit on a committee at the RYA called Participation and Membership. Um, and I'll talk later in a moment about what's in the, the, the future customer projects. I'm just going to hand over to Mark to introduce himself. Hi, I'm Mark Jardine. I'm editor of yachtsandyachting.com and sailworld.com. I've been a sailor all my life and I'm very passionate about sailing. Um, through my work, I've seen a huge amount as to what's coming in what's happening around the country and around the world with sailing events. And I can see where the participation is happening, where the growth is and where things are shrinking. And um, I'm very passionate now, especially about youth sailing because I've got two kids and I want them to become sailors for life. And this is where my input really comes in on this. Brilliant, well, thanks Liz and Mark. Um, I'm just gonna give a, a quick overview of the housekeeping. Um, just while we run through this this webinar. So first of all, time-wise, um, we're looking at running this webinar a little over an hour. There's a lot to get through, lots of information, um, but that's our aim. We're going to try and get through it as, as quickly as possible. Um, hopefully most of you have had a go at um, asking a, a question. Um, if you could keep those questions rolling in um, as we go through the presentation, we'll have breaks after a, a couple of the sections um, and, and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible, um, but we'll, we will struggle to get through all. Um, we also have a poll function, so that's our chance to ask you some questions. So we've got some questions ready to go. Uh, we'll have about three or four polls. Um, most of them are multiple choice or a quick yes, no, but you should see those questions um, just flash up on your screen and you should be able to answer them easily. And that's just a, a really good way for us to um, interact with, with you. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to, to Liz, who's going to take you on a very um, brief overview of, of, of her. It's probably worth saying that uh, Liz put together three presentations for British Marine um, with, with, with this project, all of which are over 150 slides. So you've just got a, a snapshot, believe it's on, on, on some of that research. And it's really, really 
informative and I'm sure you'll find it really interesting. So over to Liz. Okay, thanks Alistair. Um, so just briefly tonight, we're, we're sort of breaking this into sort of three sections. The first piece we'll be talking about the participation trends in sailing. Um, the second piece will go more into what's going on out there, outside world, socially, culturally, and how that starts to perhaps impact where we go with clubs and membership and, and the sport. And the last piece really is, as a result of the work, is sort of pulling out some of the pieces that I feel are, are kind of important considerations for us all, whether we're running a club or a marine business. Um, all of these things I think are, are, are relevant. I'm just going to start, we're going to challenge ourselves here and run our first poll for the evening. Um, I just get it be useful, I think, to get a feel, I can see a lot of you have signed up, just to get a feel from where you're coming from, how many of you out there are from clubs, how many are perhaps from class associations or maybe from the industry. So we're just firing up our first poll. And if you go to the right hand side, perhaps you could just quickly fill in where you're coming from. Fantastic. Wow, answers pouring in already. Brilliant, keep going, we're nearly there. Wow, so we're currently on 64% club, 5% class association, 2% commercial training centre, 15% um, commercial other, so commercial companies, and 15% from other more generally. Superb, great. Okay, we're gonna press straight on, I think, as we've got a lot, as Alistair said, to get through. Um, okay, I just need a the boys are going to change the slides for me. Fantastic. There we go. <laughs> Great. So the Future Customer Project was a project commissioned by British Marine, which is the trade body for boating and water sports. And the focus of the work was really to get an understanding of what will this industry perhaps be looking like or contending with in the next five to ten years. Um, I think the main thing to sort of get across here is the research I was asked to do was to look at all the existing research that was out there on all sports and participation in sailing and, and other sports. Um, and it's a bit bitty and mini and varied. And then on top of that, to look at the social piece and the social cultural piece. And then my job was to try and sort of knit the two together, which are, as best as possible, I will whiz you through this evening. So without further ado, we will crack straight on into the sailing trends piece. Um, suffice to say, I'm going to introduce the Arkenford Water Sports Survey, which is a tool that we've been using in the industry now for 15, 16 years. Um, and it's sponsored by all the main governing bodies in the RNLI and so on. Um, the fact that it's now been around for a long time and it's been in sort of regular uh, sort of activity annually gives us reasonably robust data. Having said that, when you do look at statistics and trends, you have to bear in mind that research is research. Some years you do get odd anomalies. So I think it's important to sort of stress that the, the brief I was given was to help just understand the trends, the overall trends out there and not get too stuck on minute eye of what happened in sort of 1990 or, or so. So just moving on from there, some of the headlines that we get to see um, talk about Overall participation in the sport is just under 7% participating in, in the 12 core boating activities. But I'd say bear in mind in that figure includes things like rowing, sculling, jet skis. Um, so my project really had to start getting under the bonnet of some of this stuff. Because there's an additional 2% that are participating in some of the lifestyle sports, such, such as surfing, paddleboarding, and things that some of us are probably doing in addition to our own sailing. So as I said, when we sort of start looking a little bit sport by sport, and particularly for me, the interest in sailing is, is always going to be there. Suddenly we see that actually when you turn the figures around, over 95% of the population aren't doing any of it. They're not doing sailing or power boating. And 90% are doing nothing to do with boating and water sports. So it kind of starts to say already, we're not on their radar. Um, equally, it means there's a huge pool of potential out there for us. Then just to dig in quickly into some of the participation figures. And I'm going to start here. This is with small boat sailing, our dinghies up to sports boats, basically anything without a cabin. And you'll see at the top line, the red line, that's the non-racing figures, which are substantially more, more than double 
the number of people that are competitively sailing in small boats. And you'll also see that in the racing figure, there's been a sort of reasonable trend downwards, unfortunately. It's kind of at the moment looks around about 60%, um, although it has been stabilizing, which is nice to see since 2011. So just shifting forwards, similar graph here for yacht sailing. And you'll see again that the top line, we've got yacht cruising, the red line. Happily, nice to see a big uplift in the last couple of years. Um, and then racing, you'll see at the bottom, a, a bit more stable perhaps, but again, just a, a gentle, gentle trend downwards. But again, I think the thing here is the significant, it's 25% the numbers that race compared to the numbers that are yacht cruising at the moment. So it kind of just puts those figures in context of who's out there and doing what. So this next slide, I apologize for it looking a bit muddled. I stole it straight out of the um, Arkenford report. Top lines are the two cruising lines. So you've got small boat cruising and yacht cruising. The bottom two lines, the blue one is dinghy racing or small boat racing, the, the green is yacht racing. So again, that gives you a bit of the perspective of the numbers and overall, Sadly, the trend lines are all very much slightly pointing down to the right, which is not what we want. And the brown, the orange line in the middle there that's crashing out somewhat, um, again, is windsurfing, but I'm not really talking about that here this evening. So jumping forwards then, another piece that uh, I spent some time looking at was the frequency of participation in each individual activity. And for sailing, very distinctly, you'll see the top two lines represent the casual users so that's casual participation five times or less and the bottom two lines uh, these are the ones that are frequent more frequent so six to twelve thirteen plus so our frequent people are you know there's a good stable line there but it's not that big um, and a big jump up for the casuals so it immediately for me asks the question of what can we do to increase those numbers of casual participants to get them to do more um, and I'd also just say, keep that picture of the regular users in mind. I will come on to that in a moment um, when we look at some of the, the other charts. Sorry, just to say very quickly, we just had a question that's come in, just asking what frequency. So those are per year on the right-hand side. Thanks, Alistair. Okay, so jumping forward then, we're gonna have a little bit shift through gender participation. So here we have, um, small boat activities, this is the non-racing. Um, overall, rather sadly for me, in each one of these charts, there's less women than men. Um, but again, you'll see here, that the women are holding their own, there's a little gentle decline from the men, but not too bad. But when we switch to our small boat racing, the picture's not quite such a happy one. Uh, the red line we've got is the men dropping, the women, although the line doesn't look as steep, when you actually look at the figures, it's 60, nearly 60% down for the women's figure. Um, so there's something going on here in the competitive side. Switching now to just cruising. A, just a, just a, sorry, just back? a quick question. Yes. What's the significance of the 2008 line? 2008, it's a good question. Um, it's very significant for me. It was the, the year of the crash. Um, quite a lot of things changed for a lot of people and I think it had a significant knock-on effect for our sport. They always say there's a, a, a one, two year delay um, and I think you can see that sort of fairly clearly here on this chart. Okay, just moving forward, we're on to yacht cruising. Um, and again here, what we see is a much um, smoother line here for, for women's participation, which I'm, I'm pleased to see. Um, and again, we see this slight uplift um, in cruising activity uh, reflected in the age groups too, and sorry, the gender groups, which is great. But when we get to yacht racing, again, um, the trend lines, whilst they're a little flatter, what you again see with the women, that has been again about a 30% drop off here over this, this period, 2002 to 2017. So fairly significant chunk of people gone missing. Now, what a lot of this work is, is looking at and talking about is the changes in what the different generations are doing. And I'd hazard a guess, having scanned down through the, uh, the list of attendees, that most of us who are here tonight or watching this are towards perhaps the, the left-hand 
columns, the baby boomers and the Generation X is here in terms of our age. Um, but significantly, I think what we need to be looking at is what's going on with the right hand columns. These are the millennials born in mid, mid 80s, 90s and Generation Z who've come around millennial onwards. So we're just going to quickly look through the age profile. Once again, starting with small boat activities, the, the non-racing. You'll see here a very distinct green line that's growing at the bottom, which is the 55 plus age group. And you'll see a fairly steady drop going on between the 16 to 34s, 35 to 54s. Overall, that's something like nearly a 30% decline um, in those two groups. A little bit of a similar, if not slightly more depressing picture for the competitive side. Um, we've got an even bigger drop in the younger generation here, in that 16 to 34 group in particular. Um, and yet again, down the bottom, the 55 plus, I mentioned under that frequency piece, the people that were doing a lot of the sport is a fairly steady line. And there's a very sort of correlation here between what's going on in small boat racing and that frequency piece. I think there's probably some pattern there that, that could evolve some further research at some point. In yacht cruising, similar picture with the green line. Again, we've got a strong growth in the 55 pluses. I'm gonna start sounding a bit repetitive here, I'm afraid. Um, and the 16 to 34s, again, there's a, a significant drop off in the overall trend. And then yacht racing, once again, similar picture, growing 55 plus, dropping away in those two other age groups. So not the prettiest of pictures at the moment in terms of our participation. And this is just another piece of research um, conducted by British Marine, a different project, but it just gives to underscore really what I'm saying here is that we've generally got stronger participation in the older age groups. Now, another piece of work that was extremely useful for this project was some work that's been done by Sport England. That's the body that funds grassroots sports. Um, this piece of research, uh, which is summarized in a, a report called Getting Active Outdoors, which I actually strongly recommend that you read, is, is a very helpful piece of work. Um, the good news, I suppose, here is that in this piece, they've identified that nearly 9 million people in the UK are active and that nearly 3 million have said that they would like to do more outdoor activity. And then there's a large tranche just to saying they're not actually active, but they'd quite like to re-engage in something. So encouraging for us as a sport. Um, this is a useful chart, I think, which just gives a little perspective on where sailing fits. So down the bottom left ring, you'll see rowing and sailing. Um, you'll see canoeing and paddling to the right, so around 2%, sailing and rowing about 1%. Lifestyle activities actually includes things like surfing and windsurfing. Um, so, yeah, we're small sports, but we're, we're up there, we feature, and, um, but it equally it says there's, there's a way to go to perhaps catch up with some of, some of the others. But the other piece of really positive news out of this research, they investigated something called latent demand, and I've just kind of alluded to that. It's just these people are indicating that they might like to do something in the next 12 months, or they may participate. And you'll see here that, you know, paddle boarding, canoeing, uh, windsurfing, sailing even, you know, we do have latent demand. And this is people saying that they would like to do these sports. So I think that that is an encouraging thing that we should be perhaps going after that latent demand. So I'm just going to draw breath for a moment and ask the lads if there's any questions we should be tackling that are coming in at this stage. First of all, yes, we will be making this available afterwards, the slides and um, the presentation available afterwards for um, people who've asked that. And um, a few people have asked and, and said, if you look post 2008 to today, that the picture looks far more healthy. But I think we should be looking on a far greater timescale than just post crash mm. on this. I think that's a very good point, Mark. And actually, what you will find is the more recent versions of the report, such as Arkenford, are drawing their data from near a period. Um, so it's making it look perhaps a little bit healthier than the history. So I think that as being perhaps the statistician in this piece, I think I feel I should point that out, that yes, we're seeing some upturn, but that, that piece around 2008, 2010, something happened. 
and we haven't really necessarily reversed those trends. And, and I think, Liz, what you're going to go on to say is um, talking about the age, the age profiles of, of the UK population and actually we're getting more and more um, elder people at the moment who are sort of holding that um, participation level up. But I suppose what you'll see as Liz goes through is some of the concern is we're just not getting the young people who are going to replace those old people in sort of 10, 15, 20 years time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. OK, so we will press on for the moment. Um, so we're going to just pick up on some of the things popping out of the, the consumer and social trends. This was, was one of the really fun parts of the, the work. Um, and I've just alluded to this diagram. It's really now sort of thinking about how people do things differently. I do hear people sort of say, oh, well, look, you know, people have stopped sailing. They've gone to university, but don't, don't worry. They will come back to the sailing club. I, I challenge that somewhat and perhaps after you've listened to this you, you might might see where I'm coming from. So as I also just mentioned yeah one of the pieces I did at this was to have a little look at where are we what's the population census in general looking like now what I've done is I've tipped the population graph on its side um, and the pink line at the top this is actually the women's figures but it works the same for the men uh, that's the population now and then what I've drawn here is I've taken the effectively a profile of the line and moved it to the right by 10 years. So the population trend line is the orange dotted line in 10 years time. Um, that's assuming everybody stays alive. But, so here's our line. Okay, but the, the thing I really want to draw attention to and being sort of serious is, is this little dip here. Because at the moment, our late teens, early 20s, you'll see there's a dip in the pink line and you map that forwards to when these people are early 20s, mid 20s, we've got a big dip coming. Now this is when a lot of people are potentially leaving university, getting married, getting you know second, third job, um, and you would hope would be having a bit of income that they can use to spend on their leisure time. So what it's saying here is we've got to be careful here, we've got a dip coming, and every other sport activity retailer is competing for the time and money of these people because this is don't forget the whole UK population census now just going forwards again to the next little dip we've got a dip at the moment in the around the 40s and late mid 40s and you map that forwards now we saw earlier in those age profiles how the current 55 something population is really very much the growth area for our sport. Now, if we map those people forwards again, um, we've got a, a dip coming well, the, when our 40 somethings reach their 50 somethings. And when our 50 and mid 50 somethings move forwards, obviously they will naturally start to decline and they will start to be doing less. So I think there's sort of three very important points here in terms of who we're selling to and who we might be selling to in the future to really bear in mind and this growth of the 50 somethings is great now and it might be great for five ten more years but i don't think we can be relying on that as, a, as an activity for the future okay so um just finish that slide off right okay jumping forwards i'm sure a number of you will be familiar with these but coming out of the sport england research was identifying this trend towards much more online communities, the kind of club activities going on without actually the need for a building, certainly no need for duties, things like WhatsApp and WhatsApp groups, uh, proliferation for things like running groups, cycling groups. And I even see that in sailing. I, mean, I belong to a number of cruising groups and the British Classics Yacht Club don't have a, a clubhouse, but we have a WhatsApp that says who's going where and where, which bay to meet in. There's also been a huge growth in things like the informal sports, the sort of boot camp, flash fitness, park run, all these things are sort of, uh, people are getting more sort of keen on doing stuff that's a bit more informal, a bit more group, a bit more sort of shared activity. Um, and it's quite often last minute decision as well to do it. And again, nothing new here, but the big growth in personal challenges, I'm, I'm sure there's people out there who've been doing their own triathlons, marathons and the rest. But significantly, and I think for, for sailing especially, there is a perceived move away from competition among young people and a move away from organised sport and a move away from anything that seems to be like formal training. 
And there's this kind of shift that they've identified, sport has identified, about taking part in stuff that's much more for functional or lifestyle reasons. And really, I think, concerning is that the word sport is a bit of a reason not to participate. And that's what, as I say, Sport England have, have identified. And behind all this is a personal challenge piece, just to sort of see that there's figures of incredible numbers, like 10,000 participants doing things like the swim Windermere. Um, obviously, London Marathon has got a quarter of a million, but these events are popping up all around the UK that are just single one-off challenges that people choose to go and do, perhaps instead of something else. Now, this move away from training is reflected in figures that uh, was kindly shared with me by British Canoe Union. This is training for their starter level activity. So this is the sort of equivalent of kind of levels one and two in, in sailing. Um, you'll see there, there's a you know, very definitely a shift downwards of people getting formal qualifications. And likewise with RYA, these are the training certificates, the, the kind of early stage certificates. Um, and again, you'll see that there's a, there's a drop off in this. And we're getting this kind of reinforced organizations such as PGL and Nielsen Holidays are saying there's, they see that they're doing less actual issuing of certificates. They're still doing the training to get people started, but people are less keen on necessarily getting the actual qualification to go away with. And that's quite important for this sport because we have a lot of training. It's a very fundamental part of what we do. OK, so just shifting onwards. I'm sure many of you have heard and read about millennial population and what they expect and there's various sort of fairly cheeky things out there on the internet about them. But one thing that is very clear is there's a, there's a generation out there that have grown up with technology and they expect things and they expect them now and they expect very much a sort of personal tailored experience. And what was fascinating moving through some of the data out there um, about this, this generation there is a really significant move away from actually owning things. And that's not necessarily just because they don't have the cash to buy a house. Some of them are actually choosing not to. They're not buying cars. They're not learning to drive necessarily. Um, I'll come on to that in a moment. But there's a really big shift, and this is really significant. But they have got spending money, and they will spend it on experiences in preference to owning something. And that, again, I think is really important because when you look at how the sport is currently set up, you tend to have to own your boat to go to your club and so on. Now, I mentioned about the driving. This was a really staggering figure of over 20% of, of youngsters who are no longer learning to drive. Um, and that's partly driven by the fact that the collaborative economy, we've got things like Uber and car share schemes and Audi where you can dial up your car by subscribing to it rather than owning it. But more and more people are not learning to drive, um, which makes it difficult then to perhaps to get their boat or windsurfer down to the beach. Other pieces coming out of this, uh, and again, this is, this is fairly obvious, that the active third age, we're all very aware that the, the population's rising, life expectancy is longer. There is a very active elder, elder population now who are out there doing more and for longer and want to keep active, which is fantastic. And at the same time, we're seeing perhaps extended families. So families have got more generations to look after, maybe grandparents, great grandparents, young people as, as people live longer. And equally through things like divorce, remarriage, the families are expanding vertically. So you may have families that have older children or young twenties, um, university age, and also trying to manage young children at the same time. That puts enormous pressures on people's time, energy, and ability to do activities that perhaps take a long time. And these guys are expecting the experiences to be flexible for them because they need to be catered for around these needs. And so the implications perhaps for, for us as a sport, it means that clubs, classes, um, you know, even sort of commercial organizations, you can be kind of thinking about what are the different products and services that we need really to offer these different generations and potentially different cultures? OK, I'm going to rattle on. Um, another big piece was the size of the population that are living in cities. And obviously, again, whilst we do have obviously lakes and rivers and things, but if you're, if you're a club that's down on the south coast and a lot of the population are living in cities, access could well become something that we need to consider. 
people have to travel, if they're not learning to drive, how are they going to get to you? And the fear factor, this is a really interesting piece, and I think it's been something that the research is saying is being exacerbated perhaps by technology, by mobile, by social. Um, there is a sort of perceived nervousness, especially among the young gener younger generation, um, of perhaps looking stupid. They don't want to be caught out on social media. They want to have their makeup on before people take pictures. It's perhaps a very different way of living and different pressure than perhaps some of our generations are, are used to. And it's important when we're perhaps offering a sport that's not necessarily the easiest to do. Now, the research on young people um, is interesting. It shows that they love to interact, they like to spend quality time together, creating memories, they want to do spontaneous things. And I think really interestingly here, and I do think this is an opportunity for us, it's suggesting that they're looking for alternatives to mainstream sports. Well, we saw earlier that sailing and rowing, we're down there at about the 1%, so I wouldn't necessarily say we're mainstream yet. So perhaps this is an opportunity um, for engaging more people with sailing. And I think one of the last points in here is about the lifestyle sports. So the research shows that more people, especially the younger generations, are interested in, in participation in things like surfing, paddleboarding, the lifestyle activities, which include some of our water sports. So again, that's, that's quite useful and quite encouraging. So just continuing on with perhaps the more cheerful news, um, I'm going to talk in a moment about what is growing in boating and water sports, but I just think, can we do our next poll? Yes. Please. Um, I think we're just going to ask how many of you from the clubs out there and organisations out there um, have other activities involved in your club? That could be paddle boarding, windsurfing. Can you give us a quick yes or no? Ooh. Well, so we're on 50-50. Oh. <laughs> Just gone down to 49% yes, 51 okay. no. Excellent. Maybe a few more votes to come in, perhaps. Seems, we might be there. Cause... Seems pretty settled. Fantastic. Great. Well, thank you for that. That's that's really interesting to see. Okay. Am I on the... Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's just have a quick look at what people are doing. So just a few slides here just to show what's going on in, in some of the water sports activities. This is the age profile trends going on in canoeing. And you'll see it's a fairly healthy growth in most of the age groups at the moment. And then flicking through to this is our combined figures. At the moment, these uh, figures are grouped together in the Arkhamford research. But you'll see this incredible uplift um, in the surfing, paddleboarding um, figures over the last sort of four or five years. Um, quite staggering. And again, growing in the 55 plus groups. And then finally, this was a surprise as well, but then less so when you think about it. Canal boating, it's a fantastic family activity. It's had some superb TV coverage recently, various TV programs. And it's, a, it's an activity that doesn't actually take that long to learn. You get your half hour induction, you get the keys, you get sent on your way and, and you're off and you can just get going. Um, so useful to see what's, what's going on. And then digging into a little bit more into why the growth is a lifestyle sports. And it was very interesting when I was with British Canoe Union and they were sharing figures of their research with me. And they put down a significant amount of growth was down to innovation in the product. And namely here, that's the things like the inflatables and the sit-ons. It's far easier to roll up your canoe and put it in your student room if it's inflatable sit-ons are, are portable. What they've also done is they've opened up canoeing to much wider section of the population. You don't all have to squeeze through that, that little hole and turn the canoe upside down as you learn to use it. You can sit on it. So whatever shape, size and age, you're more likely to be able to go, go canoeing easily. And with these sports, you know, whether it's paddleboarding, kayaking, 
many of them they're just a little bit easier to get started it's a bit easier to get going see what it is you have to do you can often hire them without qualifications they're easy to transport store share so you can see here there's you know, there's a lot of things that are going for the, the lifestyle sports and they're very quick and easy to do and you don't necessarily have to belong to a club to do them either so there's some learnings i think for us in in what the water sports sort of activities are, are achieving at the moment now this leads nicely on to a little piece in the research and again i think most of us would know this but is until recently there hasn't been figures to sort of say it we've now got stats to sort of say that people do more than one thing um, and especially within boating they might go cruising but they're also very likely then to go kayaking um, if they go yacht racing they will also likely go cruising so we know that people, and we've always known, I think, that people do more than one thing. But as an industry, we've been very good at segregating people as their dinghy sailors, their yacht racers, their, their cruisers. It's not really like that. People cross over and they're doing, doing more than one thing. And then wider than that, when you look at other sports that the boating and water sports community are doing, um, yes, of course, they're out there and the, the winners really here are, are walking, rambling, cycling, indoor swimming. And to some extent, gym, these are the things that are taking up people's time doing other stuff. And I sort of stress that we know that, but I think we tend to forget it when we're expecting people to turn up weekend after weekend to, to come and you know, go racing or sign up to do this, sign up to do that. There are all these things going on out there, but it is an opportunity for our clubs to sort of think about, well, if they're doing multiple things, perhaps they could do them from our club as opposed to from somewhere else. And we kind of have that model already. I mean, we're all pretty familiar with the, the holiday club model. Generally, we see these things out in, in Greece or somewhere lovely like the Caribbean. But the, the, club, the club model, I think, is fantastic, where there's something for everybody in the family. Not everybody's out there on the water. There's other things going on. And there's coaching available, and the boats are ready, and you just turn up, and then you hand the boat back or the canoe you hand back and go and get your, your drink or your supper or go for a swim. Um, and other organisations are successfully doing that within the UK. And again, I just think there's some learnings here as to how we set up um, to appeal to all these different generations wanting different things and wanting to do more than one thing. And I think this is a useful point also just to sort of mention that whilst we're talking about clubs here, sailing clubs as we know them are changing and the club model is changing. So we're now seeing there's more marinas out there that are setting up some form of membership club. And we're seeing training centres doing something similar, setting up some kind of membership. You've done your course, you can now come back as a member and use our equipment. And we've seen many sailing clubs are offering training and increasingly clubs offering things like boats for hire. So the club model, as it perhaps was 10, 15 years ago, um, I believe is, is changing, will probably continue to change. Okay, jumping on now to technology, um, this figure has, has probably surpassed itself by now, but more and more people are connecting via mobile. Why is that important to us? Well, if people are connecting via mobile, number one, and if your website is not responsive, don't expect them to spend time on your website understanding what it is you do as an organisation. Attention spans are short and they will move on. The other really important thing about the mobile connection is it's an expectation of the, the millennial generation, Gen Z. If there's no Wi-Fi, they'll probably move on and go to a cafe or something that there is. And if you've got rules that say things like no mobile phones in the club, bear in mind that very few people are actually making or taking calls. They might be tapping away and sharing photos of the fun times they've had, but very few people are actually letting those phones ring these days. Um, they communicate in a different way. So I think it's important just to sort of, we've got to embrace technology and mobile in, in what we do. Now, there's lots here and I, I'm going to rattle on because of, of time. Um, the collaborative economy is out there. It's changing how we buy certain things. And I'm sure many of you are already familiar with things like Airbnb and, and all Spotify. People are streaming music. They don't buy it anymore. It's coming into our industry already, and we're seeing organizations like borrow a boat. You can put your boat up and it can get just like Airbnb. People can come and use it and you get money for it. We're, there's things out there that are making participation a bit easier. 
And in particular, we're seeing some clubs springing up. And I'm using here the Boat Club Trafalgar, which is a little motorboating club where you don't have to own anything. You subscribe, just like a gym, turn up, get given the keys, you book a boat, sent, say, sent off in your boat for the day, come back, hand the keys back. You don't have to do any launching, any refueling, any of that's all taken care of as part of your membership. So hence my comment about the club model out there is already being challenged um, in different ways. Also under technology, I think it's very important to bear in mind that technology is changing how people participate in, in numerous ways and whether that's from things like fitness bands or coaching tools like the connected rackets that you can actually get data about you know, how strong your shots are, the power you're giving. It's kind of starting to say you may, you know, may not need a coach quite so regularly. There's clothing that measures what you do. Obviously, we're very familiar with um, the sporting games, the Wii Sports, and our, you know, using things like virtual and augmented reality. It's kind of changing participation. Gaming is, is huge, as again, I'm sure many of you are aware. Um, and gaming is something that we see being quite successful in yachting. I mean, some huge numbers participating in things like the Vendée Globe um, games and the Volvo games. Um, and there's people out there that spend the whole weekend going to sort of conferences, watching other people play games. I mean, personally, it's not my thing, but it's obviously popular. So it has a place for us, I believe, somewhere, somehow. And I think World Sailing are looking at this already. But I think the serious point here is, you know, if people are prepared to sit on their bike at home indoors and pedal against people all around the world um, and see how they're doing and compete they're competing in a different way without actually leaving the house it's very much say so technology is changing how people perceive they they can and will want to participate and it's opening up activities perhaps to people who haven't done them before and perhaps don't want to go out and be seen out on their bike the first few times different way of doing it in the safety of your own home okay now part of the project was about benchmarking and looking at what else is going on out there within other activities? I'm going to very quickly just rattle through some trends, which is Google search terms um, over the last, since about 2004. This is if, if people were searching on the term sailing, this is kind of what's happening in terms of the actual returns on searches. I'm going to quickly rattle through. They speak for themselves. Dinghy racing, you see kind of progressive drop off, yacht racing. So again, it says to me, something's happening out there. I can't give you the answers necessarily what, but then we look at kayaking, where you'll see regular healthy peaks. So the peaks are generally summer period. Um, so they're holding their own and, and getting a kind of a, a frequency wave that's growing again. And then this is stand up paddle boarding. Um, something's going on there too. But I think the important point out here is we have to be easy to find and provide accurate data as a sport. Um, we have tools around go canoeing and the RYA has the uh, where's my nearest. Um, but to an extent, we are sports that involve a fair amount of jargon. So we've got to be careful of not making the experience too hard or too difficult. Um, now, this is a, a recommendation that's gone forward with British Marine and, and we are working on to find some way, shape or form of making that whole Google piece and the, the, the access via the internet, a little bit easier to find your club or you know, other activities, other organizations or training centers, just making that piece a little bit, bit easier. Because when you start looking at other activities, um, golf, netball, hockey, a lot of them are running, a lot of them are doing this a little bit more effectively at the moment, making it very easy to find and book and go um, online. So that's kind of important that, that the industry takes that forward. OK, just going to draw breath again, um, take a swig of my water. Are there any questions that we should be picking out? There's, I can see they're piling in out the corner of my eye. Yeah, I, I, I think we've probably had about um, 15 questions from Dan Jaspers. So I, I think um, maybe we'll, we'll ask one of yours, yours, Dan. Sorry, sorry to name a shame, but um, fantastic to see so many questions coming in um, a lot of it there have been a lot of suggestions um, coming in which we are actually going to address towards the end of this and um, a couple of questions which I'm actually going to bring in to what I talk about later because they are very much tied in with the thinking that we have here 
So um, don't think in any way we're ignoring you. We've got all of this noted down and we will be addressing many of your points. Okay, great. There is, there is one point I'd like to address with reference to the Google search terms. And it's something that I've noticed on yachtsandyachting.com for 20 years. In the early days of Google, people used very broad search time terms. And nowadays, search terms are far more complex. So I think when you actually look at the search terms and you see the drop off in a search term such as dinghy sailing, yeah. that's to be expected. Whereas SUP, which is a relatively new phenomenon in, in the popularity, people will start, will use a broad brush search term for it. And I think that explains that in, in some part. Yeah, no, def definitely, Mark. I'm, I'm just going to very quickly just touch on um, one of the, 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 the questions which, um, which has been asked. There's been a few that Mark's going to touch on that are very much about how the Olympic success and, and, and the Olympic program sort of fits into this. But um, one relevant question is, is how can we use Olympic success to increase grassroots participation? And I think um, one of the things that Sport England are actually um, have done a lot of work on, and, and the same you know, we've been doing within the RWA is uh, behavioral change models. And one that we use is called the ACTOR model, which is the A stands for awareness, the C stands for connection, T stands for trial, O for opportunity and R for regular. But I think one thing that um, sport and activity more generally is realising is it's not enough just to have a open day or, or something similar and expect people to become you know, members of a club or frequent participants straight away. There needs to be a number of stepping stones and the key one I suppose and that's where the Olympic really um, kind of fits in is the awareness you know it, it definitely serves a purpose and it is very much about getting it um, you know into 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 people's um, you know when be it through TV be it through media um, just that they they you know suddenly it becomes on their radar if you like and they they are um, thinking about it as a, as a possible opportunity for them or their family or potentially friends um, another one that we're going to kind of touch on there's been a few questions about uh, pay and cl play culture. So I think a lot of uh, what Liz is going to go on to is going to uh, touch on that. We've got some really good um, case studies. Um, but I think um, with regards to some of the more detailed questions, I think we'll get back, we'll try and get back to you after the webinar. We've, we've got a huge amount of questions here. So uh, we're just going to carry on uh, plodding through because a lot of them are going to get answered as we go into the next section. So this is very much um, the sort of recommendations that Liz brought out, but we've made these more relevant to clubs, class associations, and the people that we see, um, you know, on this webinar and, and uh, with us here today. So back over to you, Liz. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, the title here says, I think you can perhaps see from some of the data I've already shown up that in some shape or form, the future will be different. And Equally, I think in some shape or form, we kind of need to start turning the tide, to coin a phrase at the moment, uh, on what's going on out there. So, typically, this doesn't go for every club, but having sort of sat on participation committee now for a number of years, you know, there are issues out there for, for clubs. And I found this case study in Ireland, the Dunleary Yacht Clubs, there's four of them facing declining membership. Um, they're sort of really understanding their situation that at the moment they've got members who are moving out and perhaps using the marina instead, that many are getting on in years, um, and a recognition that perhaps one of the problems they've got is there's too much focus on the current members using the existing model and not really enough focus on the changing environment, sort of hence what I've just been really kind of outlining in terms of how people are buying and doing things and, and behaving slightly differently in, in their approach to outdoor activities. Um, so on the left here, I've just summarized a few of the issues that we regularly hear about that the clubs are, are coming across with falling memberships, perhaps racing fleets, declining. Um, the, the piece about keeping young adults involved or keeping them on after they've left and gone to university, bringing in newcomers, and then other things, perhaps not so obvious, but actually 
resourcing the club, volunteers is an issue, back office resources, um, so on and so forth. And yet, on the other hand, we've then got our, our sort of customer out there who wanting things a bit quick and easy, they are not so interested in ownership, um, they want to book things now, do it now, they don't want, let's say, the, the duties. Things need to be more informal. I think we've got to think about things like junior programmes that are really only available for members. You know, perhaps that's an opportunity. Um, and even down to the basics, as I say, as I mentioned earlier, things like, well, if, if people are accessing things by mobile, does your website allow that? So some considerations really to be taking on board. Um, and then this is useful. This is a, a typical age profile shared with me by a South Coast club. And I think this really exemplifies what was in those figures that we showed earlier, the age profile figures. This drop around the 25 to, to mid to late 30s is really quite scary. Um, obviously, yeah, reasonable youth activity, reasonable sort of middle age, older age population here. But who's going to be taking over the reins if those figures continue to be so low in that 20s, 30s bracket? Question that some of us are going to have to answer, and I think question to be, be clear in yourselves is do you actually know the age profile of your members? And so to borrow from good old Charles Darwin and, and basically copying World Sailing, who are also using this at the moment, it, it isn't necessarily about being the strongest, but I think it is about adapting um, to these changes that are coming up and, and thinking differently, thinking outside the box perhaps about what we do. So I'm going to run through sort of five areas that have jumped out at me. Mark's going to help with some of this as we go. Um, and the key thing, first starting point, this is key to me because I'm a marketing person, I'm afraid I can't help myself. Um, but really important to understand if we really are an inviting and accessible sport, what's that experience like for a newcomer looking in? Well, if there's anyone on, out there listening in from Lyme Regis, then congratulations, because this is my favorite yacht club sign, despite the fact it's a little bit tatty. Um, and I realize the graphics aren't that good. Um, but what it says is, welcome to Lyme Regis Sailing Club. Please come in and ask about going sailing or look on the club's website if we are not open. It's open, it's friendly, it's really important that we think about the messaging we give um, to clubs, uh, to, sorry, to members who might be passing or coming into our club. And this is another one of their signs. It's my favorite club. We visit it in our little classic boat and I can go in and get the key and have a shower even when the club's shut, it's fantastic. Now, this is a sign taken from Sailing Club further up the South Coast. Um, and I think you've just got to ask yourself, is this right? Is this the sort of messaging we should be putting out? Now, to be fair to this particular club, they are changing their sign as a result of this report. Um, and they're going through the whole club and changing them all, which is, is fantastic news. But I think you're, many of you will agree this isn't a, a one-off problem. We see a lot of this, um, this members only, you can't come in you know, are you a member kind of activity. Um, and so my recommendation would be, you know, be your own mystery shopper for your club. Be a little bit self-critical. What does it really feel like if someone's coming in for the first time? What's their experience? It's not about you guys who are the members. It's about the people coming in at whatever age, young or old. Um, how does that compare for them perhaps with purchasing a car or purchasing something at John Lewis? What's the experience like? Another little exercise you can, can do, coming back to the benchmarking thing, is, is looking at those digital and physical touch points, taking a little bit of a look over the fence at other, other clubs, other sports. Um, I could only really do this with perhaps with the governing bodies, um, but I think it's really important that we sort of look at how we project the sport. Um, and to give some examples on this, I think first impressions and first experiences are really important. So happy, smiling faces, you know, pictures tell a thousand words. Um, it's the sort of thing that captures hearts and minds, really. So ask yourself, does your shop window, mainly your website, perhaps really appeal to those younger adults, the, the 16 to 34 year olds? Are we using contemporary colors? Are we using contemporary language? What are the kind of headlines? You know, fun field, attention grabbing, perhaps more strongly. 
strongly than, than perhaps you know going sailing in winter sorry to the RYA for that one that screen I don't think is there anymore um, it's really important in the buying process to appeal to people's emotions if you're buying something really expensive you buy with your heart initially then you use the logic in the middle to do your due diligence and then you use your emotion again does this feel right now I think appealing to people's emotions is, is important this side from Skyride is a little dated now, but there's not really a bike in sight, and yet you get the you get the picture. It's all about come and do this. It's fun, happy faces. The equipment here is taking very much the back seat, and explaining to people what you want them to do. That sort of gentle, easy to understand invitation to step forwards. This has to be really upfront. You know, do new people coming to to your site or to your brochure or whatever, do they really understand what you want from them? And does it say to them what they're going to get by getting involved in this activity? So it comes back to this really important point, which Mark will talk about in a moment, about just engaging heartstrings. Um, if you can do that well, you've got a really good chance of, of welcoming more people in. Do they understand what you do and what you offer? Because at the moment, as a sport, we have things like this. Um, and can we honestly say this looks fun and aspirational and appealing? Or is it really actually a little bit cold and grey um, and a bit red and navy? It's, it's about being contemporary and thinking about what do the audience out there really want and what will appeal to the younger generations. Now in America, this is quite interesting, again coming back to the point this is the Discover Boating site, it's not really a picture of the boat here, it's just about people having fun having a good day, and if you want to drill down and find out more, yes, you can. The other thing I've seen in my lifetime in the industry is we're incredibly good at talking about assets and widgets and gadgets and the kind of function piece. We're not particularly good, I think, at talking about the outcome. So we can talk about wind power, paddle power, motor boating, but if someone's new to this and someone's sort of thinking, well, what am I going to do with my time? Do they really, are they really, is the first question they're going to ask, well, I want to do something that's motor powered this weekend, or I want to do paddle powered. No, they're probably not. They're probably wanting something that's a really nice, fun experience. So perhaps how we talk about our sport perhaps needs to change, and we don't just talk about it that's a convenient way for the industry, and don't categorize that way. So it is about right information, right time. It's very much sort of the, the marketing piece here, breaking things down into bite-sized chunks, presenting them with the information they need at the right time um, and in the right order. And I think we'll see generally that some of the other sports out there are doing this a little bit better. Yeah, equestrianism parallels a bit with, with yachting and sailing. There's, there's lots of different disciplines and activities and we have exactly the same within in sailing. They manage it very well in terms of getting their message across. Do you want to come back? Yes, here, now click forwards, go and see what it is you want to do. So the next piece is really about asking ourselves, is the product that we're offering right? And I think I mentioned this earlier, that we might need to be considering different products for different generations within our memberships or within our, our businesses. Um, certainly from the, the Sport England and some other research, we're seeing that sports are adapting and changing due to a changing attention spans. Now, how scary is that? Um, but I think brought on by things like social media and technology, we're seeing changes in how, how much time people are prepared to give things. And it's a bit more short and sharp. And if it's not interesting and not quick and easy, perhaps not doing it. So we have seen some sports already evolve and change. Uh, we've seen cricket move to 2020. They did that sort of fairly early on. We've seen things like cardio, tennis and, and hockey evolved. You've got quick versions of the games. Um, and I think this is, again is an important lesson for us to be thinking about. Equally, the piece about young people and what they like. And the research is saying that, you know, yes, they're, they're keen to be interacting, spending time with other people, um, creating memories and looking for things that are alternatives to mainstream sports. Now, I repeat this slide deliberately because I'm about to hand over to Mark and ask him to talk a little bit from his talk at the dinghy show uh, because we are probably saying the same thing in two different rooms at the same time. Mark. Well thank you very much Liz. Um, Liz and I have actually spoken at length um, since the dinghy show 
because Liz was presenting these statistics, which completely backed up everything that I've seen in the reports, how things have changed over the last 22 years that I've been doing my job and how this is reflected in the popularity of events. I'm going to particularly focus on the youth sailing and the junior sailing here because I believe that is the key for making sailors for life and is something where we all, many of us here, will have fallen in love with sailing at a young age. And youth classes at the moment have very high turnouts at their championships, but they are under pressure. And worst of all, the attrition rate where kids give up the sport if they're involved in these championships is far too high. And I believe the current part youth pathway is too focused on the top end of the competition. And while this may be great for finding the next Ben Ainsley, it doesn't help our average club sailor. The pathway is very well meaning, but it should not be viewed as the one size fits all. And many youngsters are going into this highly competitive sailing, being left behind or leaving the sport altogether as a result of this. Some of the newer classes, which have grown with a less prospective perspective ethos are thriving and I believe it's this more casual version of sailing is where the future lies for the most participation. Yes, racing is still key, but the enjoyment of sailing is paramount. Coaching has become too intense and youngsters are often spending anything up to eight hours on the water a day. And while this might be fine for talented youngsters who've got a really serious interest, the less talented sailors are feeling intimidated and are less likely to turn out for future events if they feel they're just not going to be able to compete with the top sailors. And as Liz has outlined, many families are now leisure time challenged, particularly larger families who invariably have competing interests for both time and money. One of the questions that came in um, from Paul Wells was, do you think the Olympic emphasis is frightening younger participants from our sport. And I don't believe the Olympics itself is frightening people away, but I do believe that the youth events where everything is just so focused on the winners is frightening people away. It's when they see their peers are way ahead of where they are. And that is the focus, just all on the top level sailors. And I believe there needs to be more inclusive club-based sailing where younger youngsters are motivated to attend through enjoyment. The Olympic success shouldn't be the be all and end all for youth sailors ambitions. It's all got a bit too serious and the all important fun element that attracted many of us into the sport. And as I said earlier, many of us who are watching right now, um, we got into the sport through fun and we, the challenge is to get that fun element back for the kids today. Here on the left, you'll actually see a photo of my son, Sean, which I took in April last year. And the question here is, why is he looking so happy there? Well, that day we'd rigged up, um, he'd helmed from the beach and I just sit in the middle when he's sailing. And then he asked me the question, where are we going, Dad? And I replied, I don't know, you're helming. And from that point onwards, Sean was beaming from ear to ear for the entire day. We ended up going to the same place as usual, Hearst Castle, but it was his choice. We enjoyed a picnic on the beach, sailed around the Western Solent a bit, and then went back in. He couldn't stop talking about it and was immediately asking when he could go sailing again. He was, and still is, hooked to sailing. The interesting thing is, when I've talked to many of the top sailors, and ask them what they most enjoy about sailing, many say it's the feeling of freedom. And this is exactly what has happened here with Sean. If you give kids the freedom to make their own choices, they will take responsibility of their sailing, enjoy it far more, have fun, and get hooked on the sport that we all love for all the right reasons. We as adults often use our sailing as a method to get away from the stresses and strains of daily life. And sailing has a huge advantage over many other sports that young people take part in, as in that you can sail into old age. And there are, as 
everybody knows at every club there are old sailors sailors sailing well into their 80s who started as kids and this simply isn't true for other sports such as football rugby hockey and many other sports which kids take part in but they can't do for life sailing really is a sport for life and actually three of you through this webinar have asked don't kids when they drop off and you have the youth drop off and you've got the 18 year olds through to the 30 year olds no participation in sailing and that's dropped right off don't they come back in their 30s when they've got their kids and introduce them back into sailing well maybe but we've got to make sure they love sailing in the first place if they just all they remember is going to youth training and that is all based around the training events around the country if that is their memory of sailing they're not going to bring their kids into it unless they were right at the top end of the sport and we're going to end up with this generational thing where a smaller and smaller segment will come in and so i believe it's key to make sure the kids enjoy it and then yes as many of you asked then they will come back in in their 30s when they've got the kids and they will want to get their kids involved in saying oh jeremy thanks for telling me to take a breath of fresh air <laughs> I'd now like to focus on two events that really caught my eye last year when I was running the reports on yachtsandyachting.com. First of all, Blackwater Cadet, Cadet Week. And there I saw here a sailing event which had 140 young sailors out in the water. Yes, the racing was still the key element of it and they had the results involved. But this was completely mixed in with fancy dress competitions, tractor pulling, parents dinghy races. The younger sailors, one of their days was a trip to Mill Beach, where they all sailed across to Mill Beach. Beach. Um, there was an ice cream van there. They knew that the organizers knew the ice cream van was there. And all of the kids stopped, had ice cream, and then straight after that, they sailed back. And there were also other little trips involved, one on an East Coast oyster smack and a fast trimaran for some of the thrill seekers. Just other event based around the racing which meant that it didn't matter if you weren't that good at the racing you could take part in other things that kept you in the sport and kept you enjoying it and also they offered qualifications during during it so that you could come out with a certificate maybe from the end of the week and then also evening activities where they had roller skating absorb balling a disco essentially the club were providing something for everyone and ensuring that the kids could have fun and the next one was Solway Yacht Club's Cadet Week and there were lots of photos of the sailing sent through but the photos that really caught my eye were a few of the non-sailing events that they put on and here you'll actually see a tug of war that they did in the mud and it doesn't really matter if you've had a bad day on the water. If afterwards you're getting muddy with a bunch of your mates, you're going to get back in a good mood. And then afterwards, the kids did, didn't just do the tug of war. They ended up just running them up and down the, the muddy slope, just getting even muddier. And they just had fun. And this was, yes, it's a sailing event, but the memory that is going to stick with them is the fun that they had during the event. And therefore, in their heads, the whole idea of sailing is fun. Again, they offered qualifications during the week so that kids could come out with a certificate. And they also ran an exchange program with another club. And what this meant is when they've got good ideas, if you've got two different clubs, you've got different ideas proving successful, you're going to get the cross pollination of these ideas. And so why not talk to another club where you see things are succeeding? and say, can we do an exchange program with you? Can we get it so that we're using your ideas, you use our ideas, and then you're also gonna get members of that club coming across to your event, and they're further increasing the participation. And it means the volunteers, and again, a lot of questions have come up with reference to the volunteers. If you've got two different weeks, you've got two sets of volunteers, but the same, you can have the kids taking part in two weeks of sailing. 
Well, how have these initiatives helped participation? Well, Solway Cadet Week had 12 kids taking part just six years ago. Now they have 70 kids taking part. If all clubs could show this kind of growth, then our sport, sailing, would be expanding exponentially. Dinghy racing is still what the event centers around. We're not just saying, get rid of racing, let them just have fun all week. We're just saying, try to make it so that there's far more to do during these weeks. And so that it's, the, it's not, the racing is not the be all and end all. A lot of events are getting much, much better at distributing the prizes further down in the results. But this way, it's not just a, okay, we're gonna give this to the person who came 30th. It's making sure that everybody who is involved in the youth week is actually involved and feels involved and feels like they've come away with something. And so the key is, in my opinion, making sure that kids get into sailing for life because they find it fun. We get them hooked into the joy of it from an early age and they'll enjoy it into old age. And do you think this is actually going to affect our Olympic programs? And won't this suddenly make our sailors not to the same high standard that they are at the Olympic level? Well, from talking to a lot of the top sailors, I found it's actually very far from it. The vast majority of our Olympic squads actually sailed for fun to start off with and their races, their first races were often a few years into their sailing experience. And so it does seem the enjoyment in the sport, in sailing, as Liz said, we shouldn't really be using the term sport, just our enjoyment of sailing is absolutely key to our success in sailing as well. And it's, from there, I think if we can make it so the focus all the time is thinking about the youth events, how can we make this make sure that this is going to be enjoyed by the kids, then I think we're going to have a far greater chance of making sailors for life. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I think that's an excellent summary of um, perhaps what a lot of us feel and have observed uh, and put so, so succinctly. So just to kind of pull this section together quickly, coming back to this sort of concept of, of what's the product that you offer, I've just put a few headlines down here to just kind of think about, things to think about, what can perhaps you guys be doing that's different, that's a bit more flexible, fun, and it's not just for juniors, and I think we're seeing that in the, the questions and, and comments coming in, it's about this for adults and making things family friendly too, and asking yourself the questions, you know, what can we introduce are there other activities that will engage people to perhaps come in and do some kayaking or paddleboarding and maybe move across? And even your buildings, you know, quite often the club buildings are, are empty a lot of the time during the week. Perhaps they could be used for other activities. Very quick case study we're going to throw in here. Um, Bristol Corinthian Yacht Club um, had a falling membership. They were possibly faced with closure. Long story short, they've adopted a new strategy. They were able to adopt um, paddleboarding. They've trained themselves up to do paddleboard training. And they've, interestingly, have changed their signage and their name to embrace what they do because they realized they didn't have as much local community engagement as they would like. And as a result of becoming Cheddar Water Sports, that is the home of Bristol Corinthian Yacht Club, they're finding that the introduction of, of other activities like paddleboarding, they're growing their membership. I think it's very good food for thought um, as to what that message kind of puts out just by that, that change of name and, and change of activity and, and perhaps how they're perceived. OK, so rattling on, you'll be pleased to know we're almost on the home straight. Um, I think an area that many clubs are already thinking about is, is cost. Um, from running clubs, but also I think it's, there's an area that's about costs for participants. Um, a big issue is, is ownership, is insurance, is maintenance, then you've got to be a club member or a class association member. It all starts to add up and we've had questions already in about the, the pay and play concept. And, you know, fantastic. Again, we're seeing this, this happening, that when we look at equipment, there's more and more clubs out there looking at schemes such as fleets that members can hire um and whether it's dinghies or you know it's it's brilliant concept um 
many clubs this is only for members at the moment and again there's a potential question you could ask yourself does it have to be that way um is there another way of, of bringing people in um come into that again in a moment we've talked and touched on the holiday club model where all the kit is just ready to go um all you have to do is get afloat and i've talked to you about the the boat club and that that sort of concept of you know effectively subscription membership there are boat sharing schemes out there and that's something that could potentially be run within a club and then as i say there's the, the membership boating thing which is coming along and i'd just like to share a little bit of a club that we all know well queen mary sailing club actually has a different membership category which has been around with them now for a while and it was put together because of the issue of rising costs and commitment to boat ownership and it is entirely based on the concept of gym membership and i think they put it really well here when they sort of say well if you were going to join a gym and you were expected to take your own treadmill along um, and then you're expected to pay membership to go there and pay to park it in the gym suddenly you're facing all these costs whereas in reality obviously you pay your gym membership turn up and use all the kit um, so what they've managed to do is come up with a different category of membership which includes things like training equipment hire some one-to-one -one tuition, use of equipment, um, and it's basically this whole concept of hassle-free, less time involved to do it, less cost, and you don't have to own anything. But I think the significant thing that comes out of it is really the sort of income that comes from this. The, the 16 boats that form part of the select membership um, are responsible for something like 30% of the membership income that's coming from 4% of the boat park space. Now that's really, really quite significant if you're thinking about using your assets and even using your space differently um, within a, a club environment or organization environment. But even more interestingly, the demographic profile of the people who've joined under the select is much younger, that's the top left box here, to the demographic profile of the existing club members and I think that's a really really interesting and sort of telling slide as to who's prepared to do what in, as, a, as a member or as a as say as a, a select member so really helpful that exercise and I think again there was another really good presentation at the dinghy show from Tony Bishop at Queen Mary about that so just pressing on a little bit with um, reducing costs I'm just losing my way going backwards rather than forwards um there's a piece here also that is about really industry working together on reducing our costs at all levels and i think with clubs this is something that i'm seeing a little bit of this happen locally looking at things like we're all trying to do similar things so why not buddy up and share some of those costs or perhaps share some of the the, the burden even if it's things like combined, and Mark's alluded to this already, you know, combined racing or combined activities or challenges, things that might bring people in. Um, I often hear when I talk about pay and play, people are saying, oh, well, if we have pay and play fleets, then, you know, how, who does the maintenance? But if, if a few clubs in a similar area are thinking about going down that route, why not share the bosun and share the costs? There probably isn't enough work for six day, five, six days a week, but there might be enough work to keep someone employed across two or three clubs and there's other things like back office admin and automation again we're all struggling to find volunteers to do membership secretary and all the admin roles um, perhaps there's ways with automation and perhaps there's other ways of sharing some of these things so I think really the message that came home to me whilst doing this project we had a, a number of focus groups with people from other activities and other sports and um, and the really strong message that came out doing that was be prepared to try things differently, be prepared to change. If they don't work, doesn't matter, move on. You can do a lot of things digitally, but be ready to try, adapt, change, move on. It comes back a little bit to the Darwin piece as well. And so the last piece in here is about collaboration. And this again, I think is something, certainly with one or two of the clubs I've been members of over the years, perhaps where there's a few mental, emotional, I'm not quite sure what barriers, but one way to get people in is about opening the doors um, and letting more people come along and, and try. So coming back to the question about are we inviting and accessible, things like the gates, the signage, the barriers, 
yeah, we've got to think about that and the message it's communicating. Even things like joining fees, gyms aren't doing it anymore. So really, why are yacht clubs and sailing clubs doing joining fees? It's a question you've got to ask. Um, but footfall, getting people through the door, it's all about these opportunities to try. There are things, we've talked about open days and open events, so those are important, but it's that step forwards to the next bit. If you've had your open day, what's the next step you can take? And have you got something in your, your sort of package of you're going to offer? Well, if they come down and on an open day, can we offer them something? Like maybe make it risk-free, make the first month free. If they don't like it, well, then fine, they can walk away. Um, so, as I say, there's, there's no answers here for everybody, but there's just sort of suggestions to be kind of thinking of around but mutual cooperation there's other organizations no doubt in nearby villages or towns children's groups sports clubs perhaps it's worth talking to some of those guys perhaps they're facing similar problems but perhaps if you share membership uh, that your membership card was valid down at the tennis club or, or whatever it is perhaps there's other ways of getting people through your door that don't actually cost you anything and i touched earlier on about leveraging assets like buildings um, are non-members invited in? Are there other things you can offer, whether it might be fitness classes or gym or dance classes, or can members bring non-members down to some of these activities? And a model that I've seen a lot in Australia and once or twice in the UK that's interesting is where a club has a waterside property overlooking a beautiful view and a cafe or a restaurant. In Australia, you frequently see these are split into the public side and the members side. Um, and certainly one of my sailing clubs has one of the best views um, around the harbour I live on and it's empty most of the week. So yet it's manned um, and the, the bar is there and it's open. So perhaps we could make the club open to members, maybe a few days of the week when it's not being that busy and the public could come in. It's all thoughts. It's, it's all food for, for going forwards. But crucially, I think, again, once you've got people through that door, We've got research from the RYA's research that shows that those first two to three years of being a member are absolutely critical. And if they're going to drop out, it will probably be between one and three years. So big question again, come back to your mystery shopper. Once they're through the door, what's that experience like? What does it feel like to be a new member? Do you have induction packs? Do you perhaps have a buddy system? A bit more than just the welcome drinks and, and now you're on your own. Um, it's all about making people feel welcome uh, and wanting to move move on. So very quickly, in summary, we've talked about the participation trends, that water sports are growing, we're seeing participation in sailing, and I'd also say it's also in power boating. Those figures are down. We've got the growth of the aging boater. Um, we're seeing this drop off of, of the younger adults. Um, socially, we're seeing this kind of whole era of disruption through technology. Um, the generational differences, they are buying and doing things differently. There's, there's, you know, that is something we've just got to take on board. Um, attention spans are changing. And the customer in general, because of technology, has a lot more control and choice about what they do. We've also talked about this move away from ownership amongst the younger generation and that move towards experiences, that kind of whole book and go and trying different things. Um, the fact that people want to do things more informally, less training, shorter sessions, turn up and go. We've got virtual clubs emerging. Um, we've got the want it now culture. And, you know, challenge based is a huge piece. These challenge based activities. British Canoe Union say that the canoe trails is the most visited section of their website. This is where they highlight routes that you can go and do in your canoe. So many of us have held, and Mark alluded to this just earlier, this kind of model we've got here, the dotted line here is, is sort of traditional athletic sports where you do them while you're young, you kind of burn out in your perhaps 20s, mid 30s and stop doing that particular activity and athletics is perhaps a good example. With, with sailing, many of us hold that contention that, well, they come along when they're young, they disappear while they're off at uni, they're going to come back um, and will they come back later? But I think my contention here is really, will this picture really continue unless we start to do things a little bit differently to bring those younger people in and as Mark said, make it a passion for them at an early age so that they want to come back. Um, and it is not, there's not something else that's taking its place. So I would say if, if you take nothing else out of tonight's presentations, 
the number one thing that, that hit home to me was we've somehow, as an industry, as a sport, as an activity, need to just consider this reversing this loss of young adults. And as they said at Sir Don Leary, they think they've got about a five year window before this closes out on them. Um, and they fear that the whole scene could disappear, not helped by the lack of cash in those younger generations. So we were going to do another quick poll at this point, and I'm going to hand over to Alistair, who's going to talk about some of the initiatives that are out there that perhaps some of the organisations can get involved with. And we're just going to ask you, I think in our poll question, how many of you out there are either through your club, either as a member or a committee member or, or a training organisation, get involved with Push the Boat Out? Yeah, no, thanks, Liz. So just to, for, for those of you that don't know, I'm sure most of you are very aware of uh, Push the Boat Out. So Liz talked a lot about footfall, um, and this is an initiative that started around 2012 by, by the RWA um, to really encourage clubs and centres around the UK to open their doors um, it used to be uh, a week, it then moved to 10 days. It's now for the whole month of May. And effectively, we, the RWA, will provide a toolkit um, for clubs and centres to use um, so they can promote within their communities and, and regionally. Um, we'll also promote the event uh, nationally across the, the UK. Uh, and clubs and centres can benefit from um, a number of people who are you know, just looking for a new opportunity, and trying something different to sort of turn up at the club or centre and, and just have a go. And I suppose it, you know, it really goes back to what we uh, have been saying that this is um, kind of one part of the solution. There's obvious need to um, to have a pathway following this. And it's quite interesting from us hearing about clubs and centres. Um, you know, some extremely successful. Some have actually run push a boat out and can't run it anymore because their membership is so full. Um, whereas others are struggling a bit. And, and, and the key difference is this pathway. So it's ensuring um, that these people have something to go on to, whether it be a, a course or whether it be another open day, you know, perhaps a, a couple of weeks later or maybe a month later. Um, so they're sort of nurtured through that process of, of deciding whether to join the club or deciding whether sailing windsurfing is for them. So just to... Um, yeah, we're just uh, we're just having a look at some of the answers. So, seventy-four percent um, of people on here have have been involved in push boats. That's really fantastic. fantastic. Uh, and twenty twenty-seven percent haven't. Um, if if one if your club is one that hasn't, um, it's unfortunately too late to to sign up for this year. It, it was launched today, so it's going to be running um, for, for the next month, as I said. But we'll soon be opening. Uh, push a boat out for 2019 and it, as I said it's a it's a really good opportunity for your club or centre um, to be part of a nationally run campaign and the second um, part is we've talked a lot about young people uh, and on board is our program it's been around since 2003 but we've just um, relaunched it we've we've put a, a load of um, investments into the resources we've really tried to push the promotion um, to really get sailing and windsurfing uh, in the minds of people who may not have come into contact with the sport before. The way that we've done that is, is doing what we have done before in terms of engaging uh, schools and, and youth groups, but really hitting on the character and the life skills that we know sailing and windsurfing uh, develops in young people. So we've been working with a, a leading researcher and an academic in this area uh, a man by the name of Professor Bill Lucas, who's helped us devise this um, character structure that we can then go and promote to, to, to both um, uh, to schools, youth groups, and to parents, and just to people generally, because I think it's a real, you know, unique selling point to our sport. And of course, once we get people through the door, then it's all about giving them a fun experience, a structured experience, so that they can be very quickly become comfortable in the sport and go on and progress into club, you know, sailing, racing, um, whatever. Um, so that's that's it from this webinar. Um, I'd like to say a special thank you both to, to Liz and Mark. Uh, a number of you have asked whether this talk will be made available. Um, you should receive an email uh, probably in a, in a couple of hours time once it's uploaded on, onto the cloud. Um, and by, via that email, you should be able to 
follow a link and see the whole presentation, which includes us talking over the top of it. So it's effectively a rerun. Um, we understand that some people have been struggling to get on. Um, we will be sending out um, the same copy of the, the presentation um, out to uh, everybody who, who originally signed up um, in the first place. Um, we'll just be trying to get this message out as, as far and wide as, as possible. So, any last comments, Liz or Mark? Oh, sorry, Mark. Well, we can address some of the questions which have um, come through during this, I think, right now. But um, quite a few of them, we've got a record of every single question that's come in. And I think a lot of them, we're going to have to go away, take a look at that, and structure an answer, and we'll send it out and publicize it through all the channels that we have available to us. Um, one of the points that actually has been brought up by quite a few people, and I actually briefly brought it up, is um, some of the classes, some of the clubs, um, some of the events are already doing it right. And people have highlighted where they have, say, 40 or 50 people regularly going out and regularly having, having fun. And we completely agree. Um, there are clubs, there are classes, there are events doing it right. I think the the great thing and what we're trying to do here is make sure that those ideas can be then put into action over more clubs, classes and events. Um, Adrian um, brought up exactly that and um, just and he talked about some of the more modern classes and maybe the newer classes are coming in with newer ideas and a lot of those are addressing the points about the fun and the change is already happening this isn't a case of we're seeing everything nothing is happening in the sport we see huge initiatives going on in sailing and it's just a case of trying to accelerate that so that more and more people are making sailing a more welcoming participation activity and and just uh, the final question. So there, there's quite a few coming in about what are the RWA doing about this? Um, you know, I, I suppose we, we've referenced that quite a bit, um, but we are working hard on this. Um, a, a case example is our zone championships has recently been launched and now includes a much bigger onboard or regatta fleet with a, with a real fun emphasis. Um, we're very aware that we need to lead the way with a lot of these findings and we'll be doing that um, over the course of the next few years, and it's very much within our within our strategy to do that. Um, but you know, we need to do it as part of a wider network. It's it's not just us. It's of course club centres, the industry, um, everybody um, working together to, to to ensure that our, our sport stands the test of time. Good. The, one more thing. Um, early on, quite a few people asked, shouldn't we be asking? the millennials, the Generation Y, the Generation Z. And I think a good, I think this is just really the starting point for getting the collaboration going. And so actually, Liz, would you like to carry on on this? Yeah, that's a very good point, Mark. Um, just to say that obviously the piece of work was was commissioned for by British Marine as a sort of catalyst really to, to understand what was going on from an industry point of view. Uh, in order to do that, it's within my recommendations, I made it very clear that this needs to be a collaborative exercise with British Marine, the, the other governing bodies, such as RYA, such as British Canoe Union and others, and, and RYA especially have been incredibly helpful to get this project done and away. Um, there was a number of recommendations which were made to British Marine's board as a result of the report, which I'm not, it's not the purpose of tonight to share all those, but, but one of those pieces was a piece of research exactly as I think Mark's just sort of hinted at, about what are the barriers and motivations we talk about, we think we know why people do or don't go sailing and we talk about it, perhaps it's elitist and perhaps this, perhaps that, but we've actually underway at the moment as a result of the, the project is a piece of research looking at and talking to people who don't go sailing at the moment and don't go boating and understanding really what are their real barriers and what are their motivations, why they start or why they never start. And I think once that piece of work is available, that's going to be an incredibly helpful addition to the picture um, so that, again, we can start addressing new products or whatever else we, we want to do and change. 
So I think it is important to underline that this is a sort of it's a project that's initiated by British Marine. It's it's finding its feet. Um, uh, con you know, congratulations to the RYA for making this happen tonight as well um, to be able to share it. And uh, uh, I hope it's been useful for many of you out there. And, and thanks for listening. And I would like to bring up one last thing, and that's quite a few people have brought up with reference to smaller clubs and the fact that quite a few of the initiatives with the volunteer culture, it's relatively difficult to get those volunteers to actually take part and organize the activities. And also the pay and play culture, how can you organize that at a small club? And a lot of these questions we're going to address after this, we're going to look at your questions, look at your thoughts, and hopefully build on this and give recommendations, talk with everybody who's doing things at clubs so that we can accelerate things forwards and help clubs implement plans and strategies. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Mark. And thanks very much to you all. So um, that's it from us. Us. Any questions, please send them in. You've also got an email address uh, to send any feedback questions, and we'll be reviewing that over the next few days. Thanks again.